live NFL trivia every Wednesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge for a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. Is it ever possible to play or coach yourself out of the Hall of Fame, strictly by virtue of being bad at the end of your career? I don't mean something like Darren Sharper, where he was a lock to get in, before he did some absolutely despicable things after retiring that will for sure keep him out of the hall. I don't mean something like Antonio Brown, where he was a pretty safe bet to get in before he just left the field in the middle of a game and quit on his team. I mean a player or a coach being a pretty safe bet, but then they just stunk so badly at the end of their career that it tarnished their legacy forever. We've seen some bad final acts. Joe Namath with the Rams, Johnny Unitas with the Chargers, Franco Harris with the Seahawks, and Ken Stabler with the Saints, just to name a few, the latter of which you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner. But once you play well enough to make it into the hall by having a dominant peak and by racking up accolades, it seems like it would be impossible to take yourself out because the end of your career was so bad. And to that, I say that under the right set of circumstances, it is entirely possible. Case in point, this man right here. This is Carolina Panthers head coach George Seifert. His career started off great. He coached eight seasons with the San Francisco 49ers, made it to the NFC Championship five times, and won two Super Bowls, all while finishing with a record of 98-30, and 30, winning a whopping 77% of his games. And after leaving the 49ers following the 1996 season, if Seifert just stopped there, he would probably be in canon right now and would be in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. A coach with two rings that, on average, lost less than four games a season? A coach that had the best winning percentage of all time at the time of his resignation? Yeah, he's absolutely in the Hall. It would take some time, especially since he was only a head coach for eight years, but he would get in eventually, no doubt. But then, he had to coach in Carolina. He just had to coach for the Panthers. And that stint was so bad, that it torpedoed his Hall of Fame chances. All of the criticisms of Seifert, saying that he wasn't a great coach, and he merely inherited a fantastic roster in San Francisco, and inherited Bill Walsh's team, were magnified tenfold after whatever the heck this was. In three seasons with the Panthers, he went 16-32, with the team getting worse every year, including the worst record in the NFL in 2001. And with the 32 losses in three years, being more than he had in eight years with the 49ers. Mentioning the name George Seifert in Carolina is like mentioning Voldemort, or like mentioning the name Bruno in literally any Disney animated movie that came out in 2021. He was that bad. And of his awful coaching moments, of which there were many in Carolina, this one might have been the most baffling and the most brain-dead of them all. Because prior to a 2000 game on the road against the New Orleans Saints at the Superdome, Seifert had a bold strategy to try and get his team ready for the game, and to get his team ready for the crowd noise. And it backfired in spectacular fashion, to the point where players complained, and to the point where many were questioning the genius in charge, and understandably so. Because this is the story behind one of the stupidest coaching moments in Panthers history, one of the dumbest practices in Panthers history, and maybe the worst moment in George Seifert's NFL career. Before I talk about the actual incident in question, we need some context to understand the importance of this game, as well as why Seifert was looking to switch things up with a bold new practice strategy, which, as we'll find out in a bit, did not work out for rather obvious reasons. It's October 15th, 2000. It's week 7 of the NFL season, and we're down in New Orleans for this NFC West matchup between the Carolina Panthers and the New Orleans Saints. I'm just focusing on what this game meant for the Panthers, so I won't talk about the Saints, even though they had an identical record entering this one. But for the Panthers, this was an absolutely critical game. They entered this one sitting one game below 500 at 2-3, and, and even though they had some momentum on their side, coming off of a 26-3 victory at home against the Seattle Seahawks, and even though they weren't playing horrible football, as they had a point differential of plus 28, and had the best defense in the NFC by allowing just 76 points through 5 games, for an average of just 15.2 points per game, they would be in massive trouble if they did not win this one. The NFC was looking incredibly competitive. By this point in the season, 
They already had seven teams in the conference with three wins, and they were vying for just six spots. Lose this game, and not only do you risk dropping all the way to last place in the division at the midway point in October, but it is going to be an uphill climb to make it back to the playoffs for the first time since 1996. Of the 12 teams to make the playoffs in 1999, by the end of Week 7, all of them had at least three wins. In other words, the Panthers absolutely needed to win this game to keep pace in the conference, especially since it was against a division opponent. However, there was a major problem for the Panthers heading into this one, and that was the fact that, well, they kind of sucked when playing on the road in a dome venue. That's kind of a big deal when three of the other four teams in your division in the Rams, Saints, and Falcons all play their games indoors. The Panthers struggled heavily when playing under a roof, as in Seifert's first season in charge in 1999, the Panthers went 0-3 in those conditions. They lost their Week 1 game to the New Orleans Saints by a final score of 19-10. They lost their Week 8 game on Halloween to the Atlanta Falcons by a final score of 27-20. And they lost their Week 10 game against the eventual Super Bowl champion St. Louis Rams by a final score of 35-10. This means that, across the three road games, the Panthers were outscored 81-40, losing by an average of nearly 14 points per game. And in all three of those road games, they were down by two possessions with four minutes left, meaning that the game wasn't really a contest late. I guess the Panthers looked fine when playing outdoors, but put them indoors, and they looked like one of the worst teams in football. Now, playing indoors is a completely different beast. It's a lot louder indoors because the sound is trapped inside, and has nowhere to escape. You have different positions with the lighting as well. But still, the Panthers were not a good team inside and hadn't won a game indoors since Dom Capers was the head coach, and they beat the Indianapolis Colts in the regular season finale in 1998. Now, in fairness to Seifert, he wasn't making any excuses whatsoever. Some speculated that the reason that the Panthers were playing poorly indoors was because they weren't used to artificial turf or fluorescent lighting, but Seifert squashed those accusations very quickly, saying, no, we just haven't executed our football. However, you couldn't deny that there was a problem. As ESPN analyst Tom Jackson loved to say on NFL Primetime, once is an accident, twice is a coincidence, three times is a trend. And in the case with the Panthers, the trend was very worrying. Seifert knew that he needed to do something to try his best to get the Panthers acclimated to the tough environment that the Superdome was going to pose. And with that, Seifert thought back to something he tried in 1995 as the head coach of the San Francisco 49ers when they had to play the New Orleans Saints on the road. This was near the peak of the 49ers Saints rivalry, when the two teams absolutely hated each other. There is still that bad blood today, but it was nothing like it was at the end of the 1980s or the first half of the 1990s, when both the 49ers and the Saints were in the same division and were usually good. Seifert knew on that day that it was going to be really loud especially since the Niners were the defending champions, so he hatched up an idea to try and simulate that much-anticipated crowd noise. To try and simulate the noise, he had public relations man Dave Ron line up behind the offensive linemen during practice, who were hitting a five-man blocking sled, and Ron would stand there with a leaf blower on full blast. There aren't too many things louder than standing directly next to a leaf blower on full power. And this plan seemed to work, the 49ers won this game by a final score of 24-22, and they seemed acclimated to the noise. So Seifert thought that to get ready for this game in the Superdome, he would try that idea again with the Panthers. Hey, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? It worked the first time, so let's try it again! Especially since Seifert's previous plans of tapes with crowd noise and airplane engines didn't work. However, we have to remember something about the original leaf blower plan with the 49ers in 1995. It was one singular leaf blower lined up behind the offensive lineman. That was it. Yes, it was extremely loud, but the leaf blower was not facing the offensive lineman, so anything being pushed out from the leaf blower was going in the opposite direction. And even if something did happen to come in the direction of the offensive lineman, it's one leaf blower. It's not going to do a whole lot of damage. Seifer thought that a new millennium and a new team meant that it was time to take this leaf blower experiment to the extreme. With that, I present to you, in what feels like something straight out of a bad comedy, the dumbest practice and the dumbest moment 
of George Seifert's entire coaching career. Think of how many groundskeepers and maintenance men a team has. I mean, this is a multi-million dollar organization that needs to keep their field and their facilities in pristine condition. While there's no exact number, it's safe to say that there are a lot of them. For practice, leading up to this game, these groundskeepers would have a big part to play in ensuring the success of the team. They were not going to be doing field work or cleaning up around the facility on this day. Instead, they were going to be at practice, and were just going to stand alongside the practice field with leaf blowers. Every single person. If you were a groundskeeper or a maintenance man, guess what? On this day, your job was to stand still and just hold a leaf blower on full blast and on maximum power. This meant that surrounding the practice field in all directions was nothing but leaf blowers on full volume. Leaf blowers by the tens, Dozens upon dozens of leaf blowers. The Panthers would learn to practice while leaf blowers were surrounding the field as a way to simulate crowd noise. Now in theory, this seems like a good idea, because it is impossible to hear anything, and there is no way that the crowd will be louder than standing a few feet away from dozens of leaf blowers. However, what do leaf blowers do? They blow things. They blow smoke. And Seifert did not think this one through. The goal of this practice was to get players acclimated to loud noises. I'm sure the goal of this practice was not to make the players unable to breathe properly and to feel sick by the end of it. Because as you can probably expect, when you have dozens of leaf blowers just feet away from the players blowing smoke and objects throughout the entire practice, it did not go well, I'll put it that way. Fullback William Floyd said on this disastrous practice, I don't know what's worse, the leaf blowers or the smoke that comes from it. I thought it was at the gas station. You know what they say, if you can inhale deadly fumes, you can dodge a ball, or something like that. Quarterback Steve Berline echoed those thoughts, saying, George brought the maintenance guys out there with their little leaf blowers. He thought it would be fun to do it, but we were all inhaling those fumes. You'd think that for a man that was smart enough to win two Super Bowls and be one of the winningest coaches of all time, that he would stop to think about this for five seconds and realize, hey, wait a second, leaf blowers blow fumes. This might not be a good idea to line the perimeter of the practice field with them. However, he did not think about that. Because instead of the Panthers players running the plays and going over their assignments, they were just focused on breathing and staying alive while they were inhaling fumes every second. But hey, sometimes the craziest game plans and practice ideas work out. Over on my college football channel, I talked about that, and how Colorado once thought it was a good idea to take all of their players skiing right before a bowl game, which is insanely dangerous, but the plan somehow worked out. You can learn more about that by clicking the card in the upper right corner. So if having the players inhale fumes because you were drunkenly watching QVC one night and ordered 100 leaf blowers and now needed a way to put them to good use ends up working out and helping your team win its first road game in two years, more power to you. So let's see how this game started off. And turns it the football. The Saints pick it up. Oh god, it's gonna be one of those days, isn't it? Yeah, this game was not good for the Panthers in the slightest bit. It was a really long day for George Seifert and company, because this might have been the worst performance yet under Seifert, not just in a dome, but in general, period. The Panthers lost this game by a final score of 24-6. The Saints outgained the Panthers 397 to 141 in total yardage, meaning that the Saints had 256 more yards than the Panthers did. Carolina only held onto the ball for 24 minutes. Steve Berline took an absolute beating all day long, getting sacked a whopping six times, and backup quarterback Jeff Lewis fared no better, getting sacked twice in his limited action. This meant that the Saints recorded eight sacks, the second most sacks in a game in franchise history at the time. On Carolina's 14 drives, they punted 9 times, turned it over twice, and had one turnover on downs. On their first 5 drives of the game, the Panthers amassed negative 14 yards. If you were watching this game at home, congratulations! In the first quarter, you had more yards sitting on your couch than the Panthers did. Carolina picked up 8 first downs all game, including none throughout the entire first quarter of the contest. The leading rusher on the Panthers this day was Tim Biakabatuka. 
he had 5 rushing yards all day. The Panthers picked up 10 rushing yards total, and their longest run, courtesy of Biakabatuka, was 4 yards. While the Saints picked up 215 rushing yards on 4.6 yards per carry, the Panthers picked up 10 rushing yards on 0.8 yards per carry, less than a yard per carry on the ground. That is embarrassing on so many levels. The Saints went 9 for 17 on 3rd and 4th down, converting 53% of the time, while the Panthers went just 3 for 15, converting just 20% of the time. And on the day, between Steve Berline and Jeff Lewis, the Panthers completed less than 50% of their passes. In other words, this game was seemingly Murphy's Law in action, because everything that could have gone wrong for the Panthers on this day, did. It was that bad of a result. And it's not a surprise looking at those numbers to see why the Panthers lost this one pretty badly. Sometimes, the box score lies, and the numbers don't really paint the full picture. But they definitely do here, because this game was a disaster. Safe to say, Seifert's absolutely idiotic practice strategy, where he didn't stop to think through it for more than five seconds, did not work. Because alongside the Panthers inhaling fumes, they inhaled a big fat loss as well. So if you're a coach watching this, and you're trying to design a good practice strategy to simulate crowd noise, don't do what George Seifert did. Do literally anything else but have everyone blow leaf blowers at full blast. Because if you want to run a good practice, I think it goes without saying that you want your players to be able to breathe clean air. Because in the grand scheme of things, the only thing that the leaf blowers blew was Seifert's shot at the Hall of Fame. Get your official Jaguar Gator 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9pm Eastern for your chance to play NFL Trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at Jaguar Gator 9. To see college football videos, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.